Hey guys, it's Bear. <clears throat> Blackie and I were talking about uh, spring things and the old ways that we've just recently completed. I believe it's number 24. And in that we started to mention turkey hunting. And he and I talked after we put that one in the can, so to speak. And we're going to do an extension here on my channel of that video and wanted to show you this place and it's an awesome place to hunt uh, this is one of my favorite areas to harvest turkey if you'll look right over my shoulder along this tree line this is where he and I were gathering acorns back in the fall back in October that's the tree line that we, we shot that sequence on so there's food source if you look out here across the the food plot there's rye this is all winter rye and it's getting ready to seed that's a secondary food source I have harvested birds along this line right here back before it was cut uh, we thinned it out several years ago and you can still see a pile of, of leftovers down here that I need to burn but the thing is if you'll go back and think, what did people do before Bill Jordan invented real tree? Camouflage is nice. Let me tell you about your opponent. Your opponent has an eyesight that if he was human could read a newspaper from a mile and a half away. That's your opponent. His hearing is almost, but not quite, as sensitive. And now he has no sense of smell, so you have an, that's, that's one advantage you have. And he can pick up on movement that quickly. So, stealth is the name of the game. Do you have to have the fanciest, brand new, hottest camouflage on the market? No, you don't. But you do need to understand to work how to work what you've got sort of budget turkey hunting if you will um, my recommendation would be earth tones if you can't if you just simply can't afford the the high dollar camouflage um, earth tones would be good because it's not going to stand out this shirt I was gifted this shirt almost 40 years ago by my folk by my former father-in-law and I'm still wearing it it's it's a good shirt but it's earth tone all this messy goopy stuff that's on the front of it is 40 years of wear it's not you know it's natural uh, accent and natural accents it's not something that I'm just negligent on cleaning it um, but it does good in a shady environment now, right back over here, there's an area that is palmetto, and that would be a good spot to sit down. The pants I normally wear are old work pants. They're black, but over the years they have faded out to sort of a, a deep gray that matches the ground. Um, I would not come in with a hunter orange cap camouflage ball caps are kind of inexpensive and I would I would do that I would run that route and you may or may not want face face netting uh, with the mosquitoes being what they are here in our south in some some states in the south it's the state bird um, you might want you some mosquito netting okay uh, a good healthy dose of DEET to keep the, the pesky little critters off of you would be good because I promise you if you're sitting there in your little blind doing this turkey's gonna see you what we're gonna do is to go and take a walk and before well, before we do that I promised in in 24 that I had a surprise for you so if you'll give me just a minute to get set up, I'll show you that surprise. All right, guys. <clears throat> Normally, 
when I turkey hunt, I have a modern pump action shotgun with me. Uh, sometimes I'll also have a single shot shotgun like Blackie is so famous for carrying. I, uh, I, I've taken turkeys that way and I have set myself a challenge and this is my challenge. This is my challenge. I want to take a turkey with this. This is a smooth bore 20 gauge tool to chase. We call it a toolie. It's one shot, flint lock ignition, and you got one chance to get it right. I want one chance to get it right. It even has a safety. There's the safety. But it's very accurate, okay? You're within 50 yards. It's anything I shoot it at is toast. Um, it's a, it has a good tight pattern. Also, um, it, it's, it's very stealthy. You wouldn't think it. But I can fire this close into town. Nobody will hear it. They may hear a, a very distant thump, but if you fire a rifle or a shotgun, a modern gun up close, I mean, it's, it immediately pulls your attention in. This is not so much. And if you'll remember, I've, it may have been in the last old ways in, in 23 that we were talking about how flintlock is really an, the ultimate ignition, okay? When you run out of those little brass primers, you're sunk. Okay. When you drop, when you run out of those little brass caps, whether you're reloading or not, you're sunk. Okay. If you're using them as ignition on uh, whatever type of, uh, of pistol or rifle you've got, once you run out of them, you're sunk. But this is a rock. How common are rocks in your area? Okay. There's a reason. Is, is this the absolute ideal perfect ignition? No, not really. But there's a reason that this ignition system has been around since the, I don't know, late, mid to late 1600s. There's a reason that it's 500 years old and still available. This particular one is, like I said, it's a tool to chase produced by uh, Tennessee Valley Arms. And it was built for, by a gentleman named Matt Avance. And Matt Avance is a premium gunsmith in the world of, of muzzle loaders. He's one of those names that you mentioned with hallowed and respectful tones. Um, this particular one is treasured to me because Mr. A. Vance doesn't like making toolies. He prefers pistols and other other uh, items in their in their uh, product availability. He doesn't really like toolies, but I've got a toolie with his name on it, and for me that's a win. So. What all is involved with this? Well, to make this thing go bang, you need an ignition source. And this is my powder horn. In here is contained roughly a pound, pound and a half of black powder. To give you an idea of the cost value, the cost savings, I can fire off of that same pound and a half, I can probably fire 200 times conservatively, just guesstimating. I can take this and fire 200 rounds. If I were to buy 200 rounds of your random 12 gauge, it would be around $200.
ish. Okay, Probably on a cost per cost on on a cost per shot basis, this is much more economical. Now this fine piece of work is called a shot stake. And I've got about three pounds of lead shot in here. To make it work, you turn it down and you mash this button, and the shot will pour down into this cup. <coughs> Pardon me. You take this cup, you put it in the barrel on top of your powder, and you pour it in. Dip it up, repeat, if you want to double shot it. I've got this set, let me see if I can, this is set on, on about an ounce and a half of shot. <coughs> now let me show you this, right there, there's a gauge to set, and all I have to do is twist and push and that's the lightest load. You can see how there's a little cup in there that will measure how deep the shot, you know, the shot cup is. To put it back where I had it, I twist this tab, pull, go back across, and that's the maximum shot load. I have fired a double shot at a target, and from 25 yards, it put Excuse me. It put a hole in the target about that big. Okay. That's the size of a, oh, let's see, what would be about that big? Uh, grapefruit or something like that. But the thing about it is, is when I hit the target, it sucked the entire target off the frame and through the hole. So I know I got a good one. Just a second. <coughs> this is what ties everything together. This is your shooting bag. I have patch here if I want to shoot round ball got a patch knife. This is a very, very dear blade to me. This is made by a friend of mine named Billy Watson. Billy Watson, is, I, don't, I think he's retired now, uh, was a master knife maker. And part of what he had to do was take his blades in, the, in a test and he had to do some chopping and he had a rope hang. He had to slice through the blade without making the rope uh, dance around. He had to slice through the rope with the blade and let it drop. I mean that's just two. You had to take it and bend it all the way, bend it all the way back and stand it back up without the blade bending or breaking. And Billy passed all those tests. But that's a very, this is a very precious commodity for me. And the bag, I bought it at a rendezvous from a maker named Grey Bear. And it has walked, you can, you can look at it, it's, it, we've been in the woods together for a long, long time. Inside, I don't have much in the way of equipment inside. For round balls, this is a ball starter. And I've had this ball starter, oh, probably 40 years and it works just as good today in this box I have felt wadding and I have um, cards these are what these are called cards these are actually overshot cards, okay? These are not, uh, I'm, I'm missing one set of, of shot cards. But what I do, 
I will put this felt wadding down onto my powder. Technically, I'm supposed to take this card and put it on top of that and then put my shot, my shot on top of it and cap it with, a, with another card. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing is I'm building a shotgun, a modern shotgun shell in bits and pieces with its components. Um, in the world, in the real world, what I do is I put the felt down on top of the powder, pour my shot in on top of it, stick that on top of it and call it loaded. The thing is <clears throat> with this particular Thule, hold on, box, I can disassemble this entire gun with this box. This is a, a vise for taking the main spring off the outside. You turn this out and <clears throat> put, your, put it over your main spring and then tighten it down and compress it and then it will just, it will come apart. It will not fall apart, but it will come apart easy. I've got a uh, a uh, patch jag for this for my for the Thule. I've got a sponge for the Thule. This is where my gun butter will go on. When I get it cleaned, my gun butter goes on this and I swab the barrel and it's done. <clears throat> I can take this, this this bore brush, and I can put gun butter on it as well and scrub and it'll pull out all that fouling. This is a puller in case I need to get down into the card and pull the card out and dump the load. That's what this is for. And this, I put it on the ramrod and go to the bottom and I can scrape the breech. There's a little uh, indention at the back of the breech that this fits in perfectly. And I just spin it and it scrapes the fouling off the inside of the breech and it keeps the gun functional in the field. Um, I've got a I've got a tool set that's got a turn key a turn screw on it, and a turn screw is just an absolute fancy word for that. That's a screwdriver. This is my Leatherman. Sometimes it comes to the field. Most of the time, it stays in my belt at work. That way, I know where it's at. But this is a turnkey, late 20th century style. Flint locks are not hard, okay? It's the challenge. That's the good part. Um, what, going back to what I was going to tell you about this one. And it took me a minute to understand the concept. Blackie has helped me fix this thing more times than I care to admit, but uh, kudos to him. <clears throat> this is not a true straight shotgun barrel, a smooth bore. This is a jugged barrel, and it is a pain in the butt. I'm just going to be straight up with you. There are a lot of folks, they're a very desired barrel in the muzzle loading community. The barrel is probably worth more than the gun is. But <laughs> that having been said, it comes along, it's a, just a straight tube until you get to about here. And then it's necked. And what happens is that will that will mess up round ball. I can shoot round ball from this gun, but I have to shoot an undersized round ball with a patch. Okay, yeah, it can be done, but I have to use an undersized ball with an oversized patch to make up the difference. So let's go scout around and see what we can come up with. What you're looking at is a, I believe that's a hickory. 
It's either hickory or sawtooth oak. But uh, look how beautiful and green the leaves are. Fresh growth. And if we pan down here to the bottom, that's, that's lily of the valley. And it grows naturally down here. Always blooms just before spring. Sort of a way to get you out of the doldrums of winter. But it's one of the first flowers that comes out down here. And like I say, they're all back through the trees. As a matter of fact, if I pan to the right, you can see, let me see if I can point it out, right back up in the back of the trees, there's a carpet of white. And that's this lily of the valley. talking about natural cover and concealment. This is a good example of that. You can see that my pants kind of blend into the natural floor here because we've just recently done a controlled burn and it, it's close. It's not perfect. It's close. Um, if the sun were shining, the shadows would be coming across my shirt and giving me a natural camouflage. There are some little berms that are here in front of me. I have a 180 degree sweep of this food plot. So I have very good vis visual uh, acuity as far as the, that's what I'm able to see and not see. Um, this would be a very good place to sit. One thing that you need to remember is <clears throat> the way that it looks today is not the way that it's going to look in even two weeks because the plants that were uh, burned out by the fire are going to be replaced <clears throat> and they'll be growing up to fill in this area which will add another layer of camouflage to me and I can sit here very slowly pan my head and what I want to do is I want to move my eyes not so much my head and sitting here on the ground I want to move my head over where I can see that corner of the food plot <clears throat> and then move my eyes out, pan just my eyes, and when I get as far as I can take my eyes, move my head to that point, and then move my eyes again, so there's almost no perceptive movement to a, to a turkey. I really kind of like it here. I may sit here for a few minutes and just enjoy the cool air and the gentle breeze, but we'll look for something else. Over there at the foot of the hill, you'll see that damp ground. Well, that's a spring that comes up. It's not a very big or strong one, but it comes up and provides a little bit of a water source for the animals that are out here, <coughs> or the animals that pass through. And this is the area where Blackie and I were gathering acorns to make bread. We haven't gotten around to making bread yet. But there's one of them right there. Hold on. I just happened to look down on the ground and there that was. Now this one's been been worm eaten so it's no good. But that is a good source of food for the turkeys and for deer and whatever else may pass through. Right over here behind me, there's a funnel. Let me see if I can find it. Right over here. There it is. Right over here. Mm -hmm. There's a, an old logging road 
that animals love to use as a as a roadbed. And I remember one Easter Sunday when I was a kid, my brother and daddy and I were down here riding, checking on the cows and stuff. And it was just after sunrise, and the sun had just come over this hill behind me and was shining down through the trees from the back. And it was, it was gorgeous. I, I, there's no way I can put it into words. But standing right over here at the mouth of this road was probably the largest buck that I've ever seen down here on our property. Um, that and, a, and there was a doe with him. She was a right good sized doe too. But they were standing right over there in the edge of the woods just watching us drive by. Completely unthreatened and uh, made for quite the moment. We are, <clears throat> I have not been able to find any turkey sign out here. The ground's awfully hard. Maybe after we get a good rain, uh, they'll show up. But i um, going to walk around some more and see what else we kind of missed if we can get into. All right, guys. Blackie and I have mentioned lots of times that to be successful at hunting or fishing or whatever is to know the land that you're on. And by knowing the land that you're on, knowing the creatures that inhabit it. Well, we were riding around looking for, you know, things to add to the, to the program and we found this. You can see right here on the ground behind me. We have recently did, done a prescribed burn of this area and you can see right here very plainly where the turkeys have come in to this burned log, this dead log, and they've been scraping it out eating bugs. This is a food source. Okay? Sign like this is a sign of good turkey population. So if when you're out moving around looking for sign, look for stuff like this. It's a good indicator. All right, on to the next one. All right, guys, to wrap this thing up, <clears throat> I walked around for a little bit longer and turkeys aren't moving yet, which is fine. There's plenty of time. Uh, I do want to thank you for coming with me. I want to thank you for sharing this little adventure. If you liked it, please like, share, and subscribe. The bears always. Y'all have a good day.